which caused some heartburn because we, as Mount Lakes Human Service Zone, voted early in January to keep all the indirect monies and then reimburse back. So those that indirect that indirect cost line for each county, you can see. I think we, I broke it out each county. So you can see that that is rent, um, cars, maintenance of cars, any indirect cost. So getting back to the countywide cost allocation, it's not dollar for dollar. So say Carrie reports she spent ten dollars for the year in 2016 doing social services. She, she we did get eight percent of that back. Dalrymple, I, I can't remember, 2018, early on, changed the countywide cost allocation again in an attempt to um, <laughs> in an attempt to save property tax dollars for the citizens of the counties because social services was a heavy burden. So getting back to she reports ten dollars, we got twenty-five percent of that back. So you know, if you look on there, some of the state's attorney reimbursement is four grand, six grand. It's not a lot of money. So that's kind of the long and short of it. So what I need from you today, based on 2024, which you know we have a legislative year coming up now in January, I think that the big questions are going to be about the indirect costs and why, 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 why? Because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding I understand about that money coming back to you, and it is state dollars. There, there aren't county dollars in there, but the rub is we should get to take the state's money because we are out of our county budget paying the state's attorney. Now, our county, Towner County and Benson County, has always put that back into the, the, the social service budget, so it's not been such a rub for us. However, Burlette County, huge issue for them. Um, so, I think I hit all the high points I wanted to. Um, it's, it's, a, it's somewhat complicated, but not. So the direct, the, the budget all in total is the $5 million figure I gave you. So what I'm asking today is a motion to accept that budget. Um, I'm going to be doing the circuit. Tarrant County's commission meeting was canceled today, so I'm, I'm not going to Tarrant County, but um, yeah, so you're the first ones to get a look at it, um, the first commission to get a look at it. So I'll just stand for any questions. Rhonda. I see Tower County is like forty nine hundred and three dollars. So that cost is it on Ramsey Is that correct? Um, well, um, we we forecast that discount to be about forty nine hundred dollars. We're still running out through that. Right. So I, they they had very low. We had to mm -hmm. dig for her to get that. So um, again, if you look at the cost, you can see some of the counties are quite high. Right. And they have they rent buildings. Um, Burlette County has a building, and the sheriff's old it's an old house that the child welfare folks are in, and they charge off rent to the countywide cost allocation for that. We have space in the buildings. We have space in the one rent, which is pretty low. Um, so it, the costs are lower. Um, cars. I we did not budget for any new cars this year, <clears throat> which I'm hoping is not a mistake. Um, we have a couple cars. With pretty high mileage. We do a lot of placements, um, Raleigh, North Dakota. We drive uh, northern Minnesota. We drive, we, we have to drive a lot of places to visit children that we have place around the tri-state area, probably Colorado. We mm -hmm. don't drive there, we fly there, but that's an indirect cost. Did we put some cars into the 21 budget? No, we did not. What does the state direct us to do on that? Um, to follow the uh, procurement uh, guidelines for new cars and um, just did not have it in me to um, go. Rolette County has three cars that one of them could probably be displaced. We're running on one of them that, that with the procurement uh, regulations. A couple years in mileage, I'm not sure what they are right now, but we skimmed under that, so we did not ask for any cars. If it would have been just our county and, and town and county, um, based on our history of fixing cars, fixing cars, fixing cars, and it doesn't come out in the end, I probably would have requested a car. But um, with everything else that was going on, it just didn't seem that it was, to be really honest, worth the fight. In your opinion, do you think Scarlett County's concerns got answered the other day at our regular meeting? No. You don't think so? 
Well, I think that they understand how indirect dollars are allocated back. Um, they believe that they spent in 2016 uh, that $35,000, $8,000 to employ the state's attorney for social service costs. They want that 25% of that $3,800 they report, or $3,800 they, $30, they reported back, and that is not the way we decided to do our zone. Each zone had the option to do our financials the way we did. Um, and um, I think it's very difficult. The way the bill is written, it's a kind of an and, or, or maybe. Other zones have done this. We chose to keep all the money in Ramsey County and pay the bills, give us your bills. Because we wanted control of our budget, obviously. Right. Um, and that's been, they also um, employ our contract with the uh, custodial service to clean the two buildings that we rent in Rolette County, so their costs are higher. Um, yeah, I, I'm guessing they'll be talking to legislators and they want this portion changed. Um, I think what, what everyone forgets at the end of the day is we were, we were um, uh, levying 30, 37 mills for social services and now we're levying nothing. And they were lugging, they're maxed out at 60, their whole county, so they're really looking for any place for cash, and this has been kind of what they've zeroed in on. So that's, not to get off on Rolette County, but that's been pretty much our conversation that's on board meetings for, you know, most of the last three, four, five months. It's good for the other commissioners to hear this, mm -hmm. because none of the other counties have any problems all the indirect costs of the way. And when the board voted in January to put, it, put the financial burden on the family, which was fine the family company, it was only one way to do it. Uh, and we all agreed on that. You, know, you can't have four checkbooks in one account. Yeah, I think, you know, in a household budget, when you look at how that works sometimes with two people, it, it just is very difficult from my own experience, but um, I think that um, when you look at indirect costs, when we're looking at reported paper costs, copy machine costs, I mean, pens and paper day-to-day um, -day at 2016 levels, and it's gonna be 2021, we're gonna dip into some of that state's attorney money, and I think that's what is really difficult for the Rolette County folks to on the board anyway to understand that this is now going to be 2021 and we're operating on 2016 reported costs. So um, the other thing that I think is hard to hear and it was very loud and clear at the legislative session in the last days when this was passed and um, they took out the one-time cost, Adam you remember this, they took out the one-time cost, they took out an inflator for indirect costs which is very very concerning to everyone at the time. They wanted county commissions to have some it was about the word was back and forth the words skin in the game you have to pay something you know and i think that social services has always been kind of like well yeah yeah and so um it's a very necessary um part of our community and it, it helps uh you know we do child welfare we do elderly and disabled i mean we we serve a lot of citizens in great need and so i think that there's a Part of what the 2124, Senate Bill 2124 was designed to do was philosophical to help communities be more aware of what's going on because I think it was really easy for commissioners to just focus on the money. Unfortunately, I feel like our zone has not focused on services and focused on money just because money's tight and I get it. I mean, but we haven't spent a lot of time on services and so, you know, it, it, um, Hopefully as we go forward, we try to do some more um, education about services in the community. When you don't have services for citizens, social service costs go up. When you don't have counseling, you don't have uh, services for um, abused families, that type of thing, county social service costs go up. We're seeing, we had 30 applications. Um, well, actually, if you count across the zone, we had 38 applications for services yesterday. Folks are hurting. Um, furloughed businesses haven't opened in some of the counties. Um, I believe the casino in um, 
termite is still closed, so those folks are really looking at where food for for September. So we're busy, very busy. So, so those are some of the things that we'll have to figure out. We operate, and I also want to brag a little bit, our four counties operate very, very lean. Our ratio of SNAP households is 50, or excuse me, 91.5 families per worker, and our neighbors are going about 50 families per worker. So it's pretty frustrating to sit and know that we do twice the work as far as serving folks, because we've always operated lean. So those are some of the things that I've been not very popular with my peer group saying, hey, come on, we need to take a look at a caseload here that's equitable for all workers. So those are some of the things, and I, I kind of got off on a tangent, I apologize, but really what I want to do is to take a look at the budget, and if you have questions, I can answer them. I'm pretty passionate about the services part of it, but I'll focus on the money today. Rhonda, I, I have two questions, uh, just to make sure that I, I understand. Uh, so you said that you took a vote in January that all of the reimbursement money ends up in the, the district itself, right? In the zone, we, we put it to our financial. Our, our host county is Ramsey County, and I'm pointing at Candy because her office then took on the payroll sure. and paying all the bills, yes. Sure, uh, and is that binding towards the counties that are part of the district? So what I'm really asking is, is as it stands right now, there's no way that, that say, Roulette can treat that as general revenue for their county because of the fact that that was in. Is that correct? Uh, yes and no, they did, and they are looking for it, and they want it back. <laughs> so um, I think that um, they're short. They're, they're looking at, a, I guess I, you could ask them, but I think they told us they're looking at a huge shortfall in 2020 and projected into a large shortfall in 2021. So yes, they are looking to get at least the state's attorney. There's, a, we're down to the postage machine. It's, it's a couple hundred dollars. Sure. But, but so then the question is, 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 is that sort of a, a memorandum of understanding between the counties that we're all agreeing that in general we're going to return it, or is it binding? So if, if Roulette decided, hey, we're treat this as revenues to our county, specifically, could they do that under the law? No, it's, it's, it's in our bank account, so to speak. Okay. And at the end of the year, I know Adam has and Ed have helped to explain that we will take a look at if they're in the indirect costs. It's separated out because our financial person has been and Ramsey. You can see that in your packet. If there is money at the end of the year that will go back to Rolette County, will it be the same amount that they got that they reported in the 2016 countywide cost allocation for the state's attorney? Probably not because papers gone up, other costs have gone up. Um, so that. That, I'm sorry. I think, I think you answered my question. It's, I have one, it's, one, it's pretty confusing for folks. One more question, which is, so you, you said that the state's reimbursement rate is 25%? Is that? Just on that countywide cost allocation portion is, the, the countywide cost allocation, it's a company that does advocacy, but they look at just in those things that are claimed on there, 25% of what you claim is your reimbursement, state dollar reimbursement, which is included in the indirect pool of money, along with other costs, okay. of indirect costs. Okay, but, but, okay, yep, no, I understand, sure. Oh, okay, I, I'm, I'm sorry, it's pretty confusing, but. Um, Can I explain it how I understand it? Sure. Maybe, maybe my own perspective would come from Well. Um, <clears throat> so if you look at the, at the indirect expense sheets, at the bottom you'll have the, the uh, monthly, or the, the total, basically, and then you'll have the 25% cost countywide cost allocation on top. So essentially, essentially that 25% countywide cost allocation is what supposedly will come back to us at the end of the year for our expenses that are coming from the county. Well, you subtract that from the bottom number, that the rest of that is the indirect cost expense that's supposed to be sitting in the zone. We said to throw all that money into the zone because we didn't know what we were going to come out of the end. Well, what's happening is is the indirect costs are tracking higher than the cost that are the difference. So we're going to eat we're going to eat into that countywide cost allocation. Uh, I think Ramsey County right now we're looking at probably seven eight thousand dollars. So for us, I mean, not a huge deal. We'll just take less money in on the countywide cost allocation. But we always treat that as money that's just you know money that's coming back. We don't budget it. It just happens to come back. Whereas Rawlett, for instance, I think theirs is fifty some thousand dollars. They're expecting every penny of that to get back to them, and they're tracking high as well. So they're going to come up short. Where the rest of us are like, well, if we come up short, okay, well, we'll just have seven thousand dollars come back to us. Where they're saying, where are we going to come up with seven thousand bucks? 
and that's where their concern is because their general fund is capped out. They don't have the ability to go find more money. If we do that, we just take out our general fund. And they're at, already at 60 million. Yeah, they're, they're, at, they're at the tipping point, and we're not. They've been at 60 million. That's, that's where the concern comes. So then, then that, that does sort of give rise again to the question that I was originally going to ask, which is, is it possible or likely that the state will change or could change the reimbursement percentage in the next session? <clears throat> I think that it's very possible in the next legislative session because this has been a concern of other counties, I understand. It's going to be a topic at the um, NDACO, North Dakota Association of Counties, is going to be a session. I encourage you all to probably sign up for that to listen to that. However, I would tell you that, yes, um, we use the, if you look, we'll just look at the postage machine. <coughs> or we'll stick with the state's attorney. We use the state's attorney. In the past, Ramsey, Benson, Tower County have said, yep, we employ state's attorney. They've put all that in the general fund. They have not budgeted the re revenue coming back on a countywide cost allocation to offset their state's attorney's budget. They have not done that. They've just kept it in the social service fund. And I think Candy just, you know, followed along with how I think almost every other county was doing. There are a few, I understand, that budgeted back, like social services use four grand of the state's attorney. You know, you have to understand in some counties with the population, like Adams, I was picking on Adams County, it was probably $2,000. They probably had a case, maybe, because they don't have much child welfare. So they're, it probably ended up to be, you know, a couple hundred dollars. And, and so they just, it was a wash. But when you look at bigger counties where there's higher child welfare case load, and just looking at the state's attorney, they want that money. They're like, yeah, we, we paid, in 2016, Alec Edward is telling Adam, uh, we paid the state's attorney to do child welfare work for, for Benson County or for Roanoke County. We want that back. And we voted, like I said, in January to hold it because we're certain that copy paper, all those other indirect costs have gone up. So thanks, Adam. I appreciate that. Well, and, and the discussion at the, at the zoning board level has been, obviously changes are going to have to happen in the 2021 session. We know that Representative Westland sits on our board our district here he's very aware of it he knows he sits on the human services committee not on the approach committee but where the where the bill draft is going to get run through so he's very aware of the situation uh, it's going to be addressed it's just a matter of how is it how is it going to be addressed the other concern is that there are costs right now that are technically direct costs that are transitioning to indirect costs so if we're running at a shortfall this year we're going to run at more of a shortfall when those direct costs transition to indirect so that's something that's going to have to be addressed as well. Now, again, we've talked about from our perspective, we're going to run at a shortfall and we'll have to dip into the general. I'm still willing to trade off if we have to spend twenty or $30,000 of Ramsey County's money to get 37 mils off of us. But we've got the luxury of having money in the general and the ability to work with it, whereas some counties don't. Now, the question that comes in that might come up in the 21 session, too, is there are provisions within the bill that are kind of, I don't know if I'd say sketchy, but we're not really sure what they mean. <laughs> yeah. Let's put it that way. Where it states that if you run out of uh, indirect cost money and you don't have the ability to find more money, they, that they basically say the county should pay for any indirect cost overruns, but if you can't find more money, then the director can give you a waiver. So the question is then, a role like County, if they run out of money, would, would Chris Jones be able to give them a waiver and then they would give them cash? I mean, so that's, there's stuff that has to be cleared up. A lot of discussion is going to have to happen about how to get it straightened out, essentially. Right. If there are no changes in the bill for 2022, we'll be looking at, I'm guessing, I mean, I, it, it, well, I guess it's more than a guess. I pretty certain will be asking. Um, the director of the human services, which is Chris Jones, to, to waive their indirect costs and pay it. They just haven't got the tax base to support the social service need. And I, we, we ran into that too. We, you know, we were 10 mils over the statewide average for supporting. I gave you the one graphic um, a couple of weeks ago and I knew like, no, I threw a lot of information at you, but and Dago took three houses in three different counties and what that taxpayer pays, percentage of their taxes paid for social services, we were the highest. You know, we were higher percentage than Cass County. You can look, I don't know if you say that information, but you can see the pictures of the houses there. And so um, this is a first step, or a second step, or a third step, depending on how you look at it, at, at trying to um, 
equalize the taxpayers' burden for social services across the state instead of focusing on if you have no tax taxable land to, to, to pay your bill, so to speak, for social services. So I mean, it's a work in progress. I think there's been a lot of good work done. I think 21, 24 essentially was good. Um, like like Adam said, you know, it was 37 mils to nothing. So it, it has to be good. It was a tax saving for the counties, but there are some rubs in the lots of rubs in the right box. So. In the conversation we had at the meeting last week, I thought Albert's was, you kind of put him at ease, I thought, when he said, well, we're going to look at this at the end of the year. I mean, we really can't look at it till then and see where it ends up, you know. And he visited and said that, you know, there is, we might have to step in and talk to this director and see where that goes. I think that was helpful, yes. Yeah, we're going to we're gonna have to look at our options when we figure out exactly where we're going to be at, essentially. We have an idea, but we don't know how the costs are going to track at the end of the year to get the bills and finance. It's, it's, it's going to be, at the end of the day, the zone has to function, so we're going to have to figure out how we can how we can work together to make it work. You know, I, I sent a letter earlier to the to the auditor's uh, email stating, and I, I don't know if I included any commissioners or not, but my goal is not to levy from the general fund. I mean, we'll try our best. We've been, we operate very, very lean. We've looked at cost savings. We look at our total budget. We did save about $33,000, which is not accurate because the numbers for our, for our, um, the numbers for our, our health insurance came in later. We budgeted a 10% increase for health insurance on that $5 million direct fund. Uh, or excuse me, I, I don't know what the exact figure is for direct fund, but it actually came in at six. So there are going to be more savings from us from um, 2020 or 2021. Like I said, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the fact that we run really lean and we, give, we do provide very excellent services across our zone. There, but there are some rubs with the indirect cost formula. And we're running up a budget on direct costs. We're actually doing pretty well there overall. But it's just that indirect cost that we're running control. Yeah, you know, you can get right down to our review number is, I think, four to five dollars more than it was in 2016. I mean, it's just they, those things just add up. Okay, additional questions? Discussion. Move to approve. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve the 2021 <laughs> uh, Mountain Lakes District uh, Human Service Zone budget. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, vote by saying aye. Aye. All right. For the same time. Carrie. <coughs> Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Carrie, what time do you have? You have court to go to, correct? Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. Yep. What time will you be back? It could be very short or it could be very long. I should be back at 9.30 at the latest. Good answer. Yeah. Good it answer. depends. So. Uh, Sarah, how long are you doing today? Like, very good. Five okay, we'll get you done and then we're going to skip down to Carrie because we need Carrie here for the discussion. So, Sarah, go ahead. Okay, so just a, a little update for Harrison County Extension. Um, our marathon of achievement days finally wrapped up on August 13th with our horse show. We had a total of 60 participants in the horse show, and it was very <coughs> well uh, with all the changes that we had to make. We uh, are still have our three gardens going, and our last university gardener class also uh, ended on August 13th. We had a total of 12 participants with that. Um, every child got to harvest a pumpkin and some other produce from the gardens, and now with the the last bit of uh, garden produce we're giving it to the high school, which is one of the uh, one of the schools that is still having a salad bar this school year. Um, we recently had our 4-H family fun night, uh, which is kind of the end of the year, start of the year um, award night for all of our 4-Hers. We had that on August 26th outdoors. Um, now um, we did have the attendance, and anytime we have any. Uh, people over, uh, attendance over 25, we do have, have to have a plan approved by uh, district health and our district director. So um, going forward with 
our 4-H clubs and things like that. So anytime our 4-H clubs will, will need to have 20, more than 25 in attendance, they will have to have a plan approved. Uh, we're continuing our uh, my diabetes prevention program. We've been doing that outdoors uh, and having pretty good attendance with that. Uh, our state shotgun shoot ended up getting canned or postponed last month, but it is rescheduled for September 12th of this month. And we'll, we'll have about nine participants from Ramsey County. Uh, we are hosting a state air rifle competition on September 26th. Now with that, we are just hosting our Ramsey County. Every county is holding their own competition um, in, within their within their county to keep the numbers lower. And uh, just to let you know that NDSU always errs on the side of caution. So anytime uh, North Dakota has guidelines set for um, any COVID type situations, they're always more cautious. So that is why we, we might have a few more guidelines of what the state would have. Um, such as the, the approval that we need for uh, uh, 25 or over in attendance. Um, next, for the next meeting, our district director, uh, we have a new district director, her name is Dina Emmett, and she would like to come to the commission meeting next month and just uh, meet you guys and uh, tell her to tell a little bit about herself and uh, get to know you guys a little bit better. So she'll be with uh, Bill and I next month. And then Bill also wants to uh, just make sure everybody is just aware of the advisory for the Blue Green LG um, on, for Devil's Lake and then the warning for Stump Lake. Just to kind of be aware and be very cautious with that. So, that in a nutshell, that is what's going on with extension. Any questions? Any questions? Questions? No questions? Thank you, sir. Very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. If no one has any concerns, since Carrie asked with uh, court at 9, I'd like to jump down to the uh, new under new business and nuisance property policy discussion just because I'd like to have Carrie here for that because I'm not a lawyer. I haven't been for ever. So, uh, we put this on the agenda. Uh, Commissioner Olson asked to have it put on, so would you like to, I guess, bring up what you'd like to discuss with us? I've gotten complaints, several complaints on a piece of property, and we've had this issue for years and years and years and years. And I'm just kind of wondering what we can do to get this <clears throat> taken care of. Um, I know Bob wants to make an opinion. He's one of the people who discussed it with me. He's one of several. Well. The only thing I, I would have to say is, it's a bum eyesore, and it's a shame to see a bunch of junk laying right off of Highway 19. It doesn't speak good of our community, and I know years ago when Young's was in business, they had to put up a fence around their stuff. So, I think it's something that should be addressed in one form or another. And it's not just that one place. There are other places around the community in the two, two, two mile tutorial zone that should be addressed also. If it was in your backyard, you would not be happy. And I wonder if there's some health issues. I mean, I went out and looked at, at a couple of different places and, you know, we got cars. You know, the one has a dozen cars on it. That aren't being used. And, you know, you got to know there's skunks, you got to know there's mice. We just got to clean this up a little bit. Like Bob said, it's, it's an eyesore for our community. Uh, the one you get off the airplane, that's what you see. And it's the territorial thing, you know, you bring it up and you say, well, it's the city, and the city says it's the county, and the county says it's the city. I just like, she's <laughs> back there laughing. <laughs> um, so, so there's a couple of things that could be looked at by the commission. Um, one of it falls under the nuisance statutes in the state. So there's two different types of nuisance described by statute. One is a public nuisance, 
which comes with a host of available options to pursue, and then one is a private nuisance. Public nuisance is one that affects the entire community, the neighborhood, or a considerable amount of people. Private nuisance is one that affects a single person or a determinate number of people. Public nuisances can be charged out criminally. Um, they can be sued out civilly. Private nuisances can be handled privately through civil action and things of that nature. So that's one route. Another route that those situations can be looked at is through public health. So public health has an abatement process in Century Code. And a particular piece of property, I think, that's being discussed today, I know in 2019, they were told to clean up specific areas because of concern for rodents and other things. And they did comply and did clean up what they were asked to clean up at that point. Um, there's also a penalty in public health statutes, so if somebody fails to follow through with a directive from public health, that's a criminal offense as well. Uh, as it relates to city and county, when it's in the extraterritorial area of the city, per uh, the Attorney General's office, it falls on the county in real property. So, I'll answer that one for you. <laughs> What did you say, Gary? There's an attorney general opinion from 2005 that really comes down to city health, county health. It's county health when it's in the extraterritorial. So, those are two options to look at, to consider. Um, I think it comes down to what the commission wants to look at for a policy. Um, and I think it's worth a discussion to decide kind of what routes people want to look at going in certain scenarios and it's like a toolbox of different options that could be done. So if option A doesn't work with someone, option B might work with someone, if that makes sense. Sometimes people just need a letter, sometimes people need a phone call, and sometimes they need other invitations to come to the table <laughs> to talk about issues. Is there penalties involved then? Well, in criminal matters, there is. Um, a nuisance is an A misdemeanor, which is a maximum of 360 days in jail, $3,000 fine or both, um, and other things, probation and conditions and things like that. If you do an abatement where you go in and clean it up, then you can levy that amount against the property owner. Um, so really that's what it comes down to. Uh, the distinction is a public nuisance versus a private nuisance. So I can do some research and find out what's considered uh, public versus determinate number of people because if it's a determinate number of people under the century code, then it's a private nuisance, which means the state's not involved, the county's not involved, it's private. So maybe those are some things the commission wants to think about, consider, I can research it send a memo up to you guys. I have one question. Uh, in, in doing some research on it yesterday, um, the, I, re I recalled a couple of cases down in that Bismarck Mandan area where I read about that they had, had done something with things of this nature. And they don't have ordinance structure, just like we don't have ordinance structure, which would allow for a fine and then, you know, escalating up to try to get things accomplished. They have it actually, um, it, I shouldn't say bird, but it's a portion of their planning and zoning okay. where they have a they have language in their planning and zoning that states you have to have this in your, your front yard has to be clean at this point this kind of stuff that has different parameters and policy essentially and then they enforce it under their planning and zoning guidelines which still like, then rolls back to a public nuisance misdemeanor B and all that kind of stuff they they have the ability to then enforce over that now my question would be since we don't have planning and zoning authority over that area does it still roll back to the county then well according to the attorney general opinion that i looked at it does in that limited scenario for could the township change in zoning township could take a look at things too yeah well the, the township zoning would well, I guess the township zoning in the situation would matter, but it's still extraterritorial zoning, though. Yeah. So that's, again, down to that. Is it, is it our... It's, you know, our it's our responsibility in a public health action. In a public health action. Under Century Code. 
and, and the parameters for So, for example, if we had a home rule charter, <laughs> ordinances, if those powers are in there, could be built in. Yeah. What township are we in there, Bob? Creel? Creel. That's Creel. Has anybody talked to this gentleman? As far as I know, nobody's, visit, nobody's addressed it with him since 2019. And what he was asked to do in 2019, he did do. So you would, you just basically have to decide if it's a public or a private. Well, the statute is pretty private nuisance is a single person affected or a determinate number of people. So if three people are complaining, it's a determinate number of people, in my opinion. If it's an entire neighborhood or considerable, and that's what it says, neighborhood or considerable amount of people. So I can research and see what's defined as considerable. If there's any case law that defines considerable, if there's not, then it's just a dictionary. So well, I can tell I'm you saying you, those I can are tell the options. Over the years, I've heard considerable. <laughs> so and considerable to you is what? Five, six, twelve, fourteen? Twenty. Twenty. You okay? Well, that 25. helps. Five. That helps because I think it was less the last time I heard about it. So. Well, basically, anybody in, in, the, in the wood woodland area has made a comment somewhere along. I guess from my perspective, like I don't disagree with you, but the most important thing to me is if we're going to do anything, like you said, there's more than one property that oh. this could affect. So we have to structure a policy that's going to be fair and equitable to everybody. So if we're going to start enforcing things, it's going to be enforced on Absolutely. everyone Absolutely. When, when, when an enforcement action occurs. Yeah. So we we have to, I, I think, at least in my opinion, I, I like the concept of Carrie saying we need to determine what what the difference is between the private and the public, and then and then determine when when do you take a health action versus a non-health action and things like that. So we, we at least have some parameters for how we're going to go forward instead of just you know. But it's it, it's 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 something that's been brought to my attention multiple times. Here. So uh, it's something to at least discuss and try to come up with some type of a thought process on if we're going to do anything and how we're going to vote. Well, I agree with Adam. We have a uniform policy. Well, to, your, to your knowledge, Adam, do you have any idea if there's anything in our zoning plan right now? I went and looked last night and I saw absolutely nothing. I looked under the residential the residential zoning ordinances and then I, or the residential zoning portion and then I also went and looked under the enforcement guidelines uh, and it's pretty much nothing. Uh, the, looking at Burley's as well as Morton's, uh, they had specific parameters for um, residential guidelines as well as commercial and industrial guidelines and it had to do with uh, uh, parking of vehicles, things like that, non-use non -use vehicles, things like that. Also the option of uh, something like, uh, like Bob said, you know, uh, you know, if you wanted to put stuff in your front yard, that's fine, check the fence, things like that. There's different parameters in, uh, in that restriction essentially so but but being it's a it's a zoning issue how they perceive it how they do it I, I don't know if those parameters would even fall under something we could enforce you know being it's, it's we would have to attack it essentially from a public health standpoint or you know depending on what we can and cannot do legally essentially basically the only thing we could do is go ask them well, they probably had no well, no. I mean, it can be directed to the public health process, number one. Number two, if there was a determination to do a public nuisance action, then it, it's a penalty there if they don't do something. I mean, that could be the deal. Do this or we're looking at this. So, like I talked with Commissioner Olson, I said, if you want me to start with a letter, I can certainly start with a letter and see. I mean, they responded to the last one, but... I don't know how much they actually cleaned the last one, but I was told that whatever they were asked to clean up was done. So that wasn't through through the state's attorney's office, the last one. 
I sort of think it would be helpful to go a little bit in both directions, which is to say, you know, the problem areas that we have, you potentially drop the policy that, that can address that in terms of nuisance. But then I also think that uh, we should probably take a look at whether or not we can include it in zoning um, and, and invite the townships that have zoning authority to do the same in their, uh, in their zoning. And then that way, you're hopefully preventing problems from ever occurring down the road. So, uh, addressing the problems that exist now and potentially you know, stymieing future ones. I think the nice thing about including in zoning and what I've seen uh, is there's a built in appeals process and things like that, too. So, if, if, if a concern is brought and then they say, well, this isn't what it actually is, then they can work through appeals process, they can go through the planning and zoning board, and it actually has a pretty good function, it looked like to me, versus just this is what you're going to do otherwise. <laughs> you know. This is what's going to happen. So, does Creel Township have any zoning and planning? I, have no, I don't live in Creel Township. Yes, they do. Yeah, they do. They have their own separate. Yeah. So they they're do. aware of this? Yeah. We should start with that. I, I think the concern has always been is who's got the oversight? <laughs> it's yeah. been the constant question because it's since, I mean, specific to this one situation, it's, it's actually territorial. <coughs> it's, is it county? Is it township? Is it city? I agree with you, but we should all get on the same page. No, yeah, and I think that's where having this discussion was was a, was a positive step in trying to get us all on the same page so we can figure out whose oversight it is. But that's the same point. Like I said, I think the concept of drafting a whole policy, you know, doesn't have to be anything massive, but just this is how we're what we're expecting and how we're going to enforce it. I think would be reasonable. Is that individual operating a home-based business? <laughs> I have no idea. You know, it's a fine home based business. Well, <laughs> they, you know, is it an ongoing business that's improperly functioning based on what their current zoning is with the township? Uh, you know, I, I think that township has addressed ongoing home businesses in the past. Uh, to me, I, this would fall right in line with with what they've done in the past for home-based businesses and, and, and commercial entities. Um, okay. So, what's our what's our what's our action plan? I guess then. Uh, allow Carrie to do some additional research and then bring us back uh, yep, and on I can, what we can and can't do versus... Well, I can bring you back policy. your toolbox of what you can and cannot do and then you're going to... I can see if there's draft policies besides the ones you're looking at in zoning anywhere else and then the commission hopefully has a variety of things to choose from. Well, I mean, I, I just looked at the two counties, so yeah, there might be right. all kinds of different ways yep. to enforce it. You know, I think that that all makes sense, and then I'd say let's open a, a dialogue with the, the township and see whether or not there's any interest on there in changing uh, their their township zoning, and we could potentially take a look at our zoning as well on the countywide level. That would make sense as well. Carrie, yeah. would it make sense to send them a letter right off the bat? Or I th think it would. I mean, they were pretty receptive to it. It might be a little soft pretty quick. But from what it could, for the time being. Do we need a motion to that effect? I will say no. I'll second. Okay, so I will send them a letter and make sure that Candy has a copy for you guys. Okay. okay. 50 cents might clean it all up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We, got a, we have a motion and a second to have the state's attorney send a letter to the individual about uh, cleanup and then also to come back with a uh, toolbox uh, option for us to draft policy. Further <coughs> discussion? Seeing none, all in favor vote by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Go same time. Motion carries. Very good. Thank you. Got Thank you. Guys. We got done 10 minutes to yes. look at that. Okay, we're going to go back up and we actually ran past just a little bit to 845, so we will come back up to. Richard, and if I get your name wrong, excuse me, Bruckner or Bruckner? Bruckner. Bruckner. Very good. Thank you. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, as the information that was forwarded to the commissioners, 
Uh, I'm Rich Reckner, the president of the North Coast Sport Fishing Congress, and introduce you today to a program that the North Dakota Game and Fish have put together. It's a partnership program, and it identifies the development of wash stations or aquatic conditions of wash stations available by them. Now, my presence before you today is to see if Ramsey County commissioners are interested in joining what I believe would be a, a good approach as a tri-county approach to wash stations, working with Benson County and Nelson County on the development of these stations. In other words, basically developing a tri-county aquatic nuisance management group or management team to ensure that uh, adequate wash stations are placed around our waters and recreational waters in Devil's Lake. Currently, Devil's Lake, uh, being unique in itself, represents the highest number of out-of-state registered watercraft. And any given weekend, we have anywhere from 40 to 50 percent of the watercraft in Devil's Lake coming from out-of-state. This is higher than any other body of water in North Dakota, which puts us at the greatest risk. Here in North Dakota, we have a handful, a dozen or more aquatic nuisances that exist. If we go across the river to Minnesota, they've identified approximately somewhere between 25 and 30 aquatic nuisances that exist there. If we go further east, we get to Wisconsin, there's somewhere between 30 and 35 aquatic nuisances. And these are the two states that bring uh, most out-of-state watercraft to North Dakota, is Minnesota and Wisconsin, to our area. So, here today, I'm asking if Ramsey County would be interested in joining Benson County and Nelson County in developing a tri-county aquatic nuisance board or management team. This morning, I was on the agenda of Benson County and they agreed that they would be interested in developing or becoming part of a team that would address aquatic nuisances and working with game and fish and other entities to develop wash stations. So that's my question today. Is there interest, no commitment by you other than interest, no financial commitment, but there is an outline there by uh, game and fish on that partnership program. I'll try to answer any questions you might have. There's no financial commitment? Not today. I'm asking. No, no, no. But in the future? In no, the future, there good. certainly could be. Right here. The sponsor will provide all needed infrastructure. Sponsor will be responsible solely for operating the station and all staffing. Yeah, so there would there would be cost down the road, presumably split with anybody else who agrees. Um, how many stations? No idea. You got a large body of water. Uh, what I see is, is the Nelson County putting in one down at Stump Lake, working with their park district down there. Uh, Benson County putting something over in the Minnewaukan area. Uh, Ramsey County doing something along Highway 2, so it's a highly visible, easy access location. I know that the State Game and Fish Department is working with parks and recs on the state level to put wash stations in our state parks, so Graham's Island would probably have their own. And I'm also on the agenda to, or getting on the agenda with uh, Spirit Lake Casino to see if Paul and those folks are interested in, in putting one on their property at, at the, the marina. So sponsors are defined as anyone that wants to be sponsors are not individual. Just... If you can find an individual business who wants to be a sponsor, that is certainly available. Uh, that opportunity exists. Um, you should. You should talk to the city that looks like see if they want to sponsor it too. I can certainly do that, see if they want to be part of this as well. Yeah. I just don't believe that there's a individual business that's going to be able to stand by itself because I think this is underfunded in our area. In a smaller community, some, some small lake in southeast North Dakota or other area uh, where they do not have 40 to 50 percent of the uh, uh, watercraft coming from out of state, they're probably more than efficient being able to handle it. But in this particular case, the amount of units that should be going through or should be being checked, uh, 
that's a, it's a big commitment by business if it's going to be done effectively. One thing that, you know, North Dakota sits with about, like I said, you know, only a dozen or so aquatic nuisances in our state. But the risk for the future of devil flake is extremely high. Because the more and more aquatic nuisances that pop up, and they're going to continue to pop up, this world's not going to change. There's going to be more and more as, as life goes on. So getting these stations in place and getting them done correctly the first time is really essential, especially for our community. And we may already have zebra mussels here. That's not stopping the next 10 or 20 aquatic nuisances that may be coming to North Dakota. You think they're already here? I don't know if they are or not. The state has not been able to find any villagers in Devil's Lake, but there's certainly if they're in, in uh, Ashtabula and Lamore Lake, uh, that there's a risk that they could be here too. You have experts right there. <laughs> I was going to say we got some we got some pretty notable fishermen yeah. sitting in the vet. And, and we discussed this at Lake Access, and Johnny Campbell had some very good points. So I'm Johnny Campbell, uh, president of the Lake Region Bank. Like Thank you, um, thank you, Rich, for bringing this to attention to the county commission. And the aquatic nuisance species is a really big one. There's no doubt about it. My personal background: I'm from Ohio. I remember boating on Lake Erie when the zebra mussel was first discovered in January Lakes in the early 80s. And I watched the millions and millions and billions of dollars of damage that zebra mussels did to everything before it affected sport fishing, right? Uh, water intake, power plants, all those kind of things. We're kind of fortunate in the Midwest where we live here at Devil's Lake that we don't have a huge industry and that kind of thing with a lot of pumps and all that. But that zebra mussels could clog and shut down. Well, we do have some with pumping stations and all that. So there's a concern, not just in the recreational industry, but in the, in the business industry as well, public utilities, all that. So I think we all agree that zebra mussels are the last thing we want in our lake. We don't want any new types of vegetation in our bodies of water, right? Because it upsets the ecology of the, of the, the system, the ecosystem changes, fishing changes, and we can debate all day long what's most important to the community of Devil's Lake, but I think, again, everyone in this room would agree that if that lake goes away and that beautiful, wonderful tasting walleye disappears, we're all in our world hurt, right? There's a lot of dollars generated for our community because people want to come here and catch fish out of that right? So we have to fight the fight to keep that stuff out. Wash stations are definitely a step in the right direction, uh, and I kind of have to be careful here not to interject too many personal thoughts with my Lake Region Angler hat, but I read the one-page document that was available to me about these wash stations. Maybe it's two, I'm not sure. I think it's probably the same one everyone has. And it's just enough to do what Rich has done, but it's really not enough to make a decision on. There's so many holes in, in the preliminary, right? Where are they going to be? Who's going to pay for it? How much is going to be involved? Uh, there's a chance that it could be a hot water washed down, which needs to be manned constantly because you can't have the public coming in, spraying high pressure hot water all over the place and burning someone's skin or taking a digit off. Right? We all know what high pressure hot water can do. And it doesn't say, are they going to be high pressure hot water or are they not going to be high pressure hot water? Are they going to be low pressure uh, regular water? Well, heck, we already have car washes in Devil's Lake, North Dakota that are the same or not the same. So uh, I love the fact that someone is thinking ahead. I think it's long overdue, but I think somebody needs to ask a lot more questions. I know the Lake Region Anglers, we have our first meeting uh, of the fall tonight, and it's on our agenda to discuss this as a group. You know, are we going to jump behind the plan that kind of says, well, let's throw some wash stations out there and see what happens. I'd love to jump behind a plan that says, here's what they're going to be, here's who's going to man them. They are required to be used, because right now they're not. It's, here's a big sign and a wash station, and if you want to drive right by it and ignore it, you can drive by, right by it and ignore it. Uh, if they're manned and no one's there to man it, and you come through from Wisconsin at 10 o'clock at night, and you want to go fish at 6 o'clock the next morning, and 
yes, I was supposed to use the wash station, but there was no one there to run it for me, then does the wash station even need to be? Right? Because if you miss one guy, you might as well miss them all. Uh, so uh, again, I love the idea, I love the concept. We need people to get behind it, but right now I think we need a lot more questions answered. Uh, I would urge the county commission to ask some of those questions because the more of us that ask those questions, the better off we are to get answers. Uh, sometimes I have a way of rubbing Greg Powers the wrong way at the state because I don't really like the answers he gives me sometimes. And I don't like to get the answer as quickly as I could. Maybe the county commission, if they show interest, could get those answers quicker. I know Rich is asking questions from the Sport Fishing Congress, but I think all of us need to ask these questions, not just check the box and say, sure, we're in. Because we don't even know what we're in for. It's maybe we're going to get one, maybe we're going to get three. Where do you put them? Are they on the lake, or off the lake, are they man or not man? I'm not on the commission, but I don't know if I could check the commitment to look at a sheet of paper and say, sure, let's give it a try. How many, so, I had a question. How many cleaning stations is there? Three? No. Four? Fish cleaning stations? Yeah, fish cleaning? Yeah, four. three outdoor and one. Right there. Plus yeah. independent ones. Yeah, and then there's right. all the hotels. And right, yeah. Four that the, 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 you know, the, the chamber yeah. takes care of. Is that mm -hmm. what you say? Yeah. This is a little more complicated than a fish cleaning station. Well, the the urgency. Yeah, we need some more answers. Yeah, the some more and, the ur and, and the urgency of use, right? Uh, I'm not a fan of putting out a wash station that says, if you feel like you have the time to do this, then please you can. If we're going to put them up, and, and now we're getting into legislation and all that, but if we're going to have wash stations, then they should be mandatory if you come from out of state to use them before you put your bowl in the water. Well, now we just opened a Pandora's box. That's much, much bigger than the Ramsey County Commission, correct? Absolutely. We, absolutely. And is the state willing to go that step that says, okay, we're going to put wash stations in, but if you come from out of state, you have to use them? They did issue a $15 uh, permit requirement to at least acknowledge the fact that you understand what aquatic use of species are. We did that last year with the Sport Fishing Congress. So if you come from out of state with a boat, you have to have a fifteen dollar sticker that goes on your boat, and by purchasing that sticker, at least we know you've been made aware of the fact that you could be bringing something here that we don't want. But there's no requirement that because I bought this sticker, I have to clean my boat, or because I bought this sticker, I have to dry my boat, or it's just I bought the sticker and I can still ignore. There is no rule saying you have to do one dang thing to protect your boat from bringing something to our water. Right, there still isn't. And these wash stations, although they're set in the right direction, they still don't come with a law or a rule that says they have to be used in order to prevent the spread of these species. In how, my many, mind, how many should there be? Oh, you should at least have one from every direction coming to the lake, right? And they can't be on the lake. They have to be before you get to the lake. So something in Lakota would make sense from the east, right? Something in the south, 15 miles south of the lake. Because if you let someone get to their hotel or their resort, they're not going to backtrack in the morning before they go fishing to clean their boat, right? They're going to get to their resort, they're going to make camp, they're going to get in their room, and they're going to go fish in the morning. So you got to get them before they get to the water. One of the things that's been discussed for many, many years is doing it at the border, right? Do it at the border. We're kind of fortunate. We don't have a lot of thoroughfares that people get in and out of our state. Yeah, you can sneak around, right? We all know the little back road that crosses this border or that border, but try to drive through the state of Montana with a boat. Try to drive through uh, Washington or Idaho or Oregon, because I travel to all those places with a boat. I'll get stopped three times in one day to have the same boat inspected by three different states. Because every time you cross the border with a boat behind your truck, they pull you into a boat check, and if you don't stop, the red lights come on and you get pulled over three miles down the road. Don't ask me how I know. Okay, it happens. I missed the sign, I didn't see the sign, and they got me before I would get to the next exit on the interstate. So there are other ways. Uh, again, wash stations are critical, it's a big part of it. Uh, I, I 
I am urging Ramsey County and the City of Devils Lake and all the townships to be involved. Our English Club will be involved. We want this to happen. But again, I think there's a lot of questions that need to be answered before we rubber stamp. Yes, let's move forward with this. Because I don't like being involved with projects that are destined to failure because you don't have enough information. That's where I think myself and the big region anglers are going to stand on this topic. So thanks for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it seems to me like the direction that we end up going with this, or anyone in respect to Double Lincoln is going with, with this, will depend on how many sponsors it has. You know, if you only have three sponsors, you might. Bob, I've got a question for you. <coughs> the, uh, on the 23rd of September, we see it's Dan Holland, not Ben Holland, and he's the NS coordinator for the state and one other individual are going to be at Lake Access to explain wash stations and proposals. So we should probably wait till after that before we make a decision. Well, Ben that said that. that he would come. If the Ramsey County Commission and Nelson County and Benson County agreed to join forces to develop a management team, he would come and speak directly to that group. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't see, so that's kind of where I was going. I don't see anything wrong with at least initially uh, supporting the idea of looking at what the options are. Because I don't know that we'll be able to actually accurately look at what the options are unless we know who's all going to be involved. Well, yeah, we have to have preliminary discussions so we can ask those questions and, and say, you know, what's, what's the plan here? I mean, it seems to me that Game and Fish should have some some in, at least we think some insight into where these things should be sitting and how we should go about doing this. Plus, locally, you should be able to say that's not going to work or it's going to work. <laughs> when we've got people that know the lake better than probably anybody around. So, and I would be more than willing to donate some time, uh, you know, a meeting here, phone call there, whatever anybody needs uh, to help, um, both as a person and as the Lake Region Anglers president falls under what I do, and obviously I'm passionate about the lake, anybody that knows me knows I'm passionate about the lake, and I don't want to see it, I don't want to see it destroyed by something that could be stopped, so it's very important to all of us. Like you said, a, a rough outline doesn't doesn't constitute a plan yet. So right. Sit down and actually have the discussions about how it's going to function, who's going to be involved, and all of those things, you know, commitment-wise and everything, but I don't think there's anything wrong from this my perspective, we start to have those discussions and see what we're going to do. Yeah, do we need that motion and how should we work that? <laughs> I don't I don't wanna I don't wanna put us on the hook for whatever may come out of it, but at least to say that uh, I make the motion that Ramsey County will uh, we'll explore our yeah, options. explore the options that are available and, and contingent uh, on a contingent basis support the idea of uh, creating a wash station. Uh, about the just the Tri County management team interested in that. Working with Nelson County and Benson County. Well, I think any 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 plan that would work for the lake would need to involve that. I mean, if only one of the counties is doing something, the other two are not. You have not accomplished a whole lot. Uh, so I suppose that yes, I would include that in the motion. Look into that as well. Is that kind of what uh, Benson County did this morning? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that open for financial, no obligation, just women of interest to join for me. One should earn more. Okay. An interest to more. Join forces. So we're express we're making a motion that we are willing to participate to look at our options essentially. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that. We have a second. Further discussion? I've been on that ANS committee for 10 years down in the state and gone through a couple of different ANS coordinators. And uh, this is a step in the right direction. Um, you know, we talk a lot about tools in our toolbox here at the commission. And a wash station would certainly be another tool in that toolbox of, of ANS prevention. Um, we get criticized a lot about our water quality downstream, um, but one of the things that we don't have in Devil's Lake is aquatic nuisance. Um, we may have some additional salts and things that people may not like, 
Um, but we don't have zebra mussels. We don't have a lot of the other things that are that we want to keep away and, and keep out. And so this will go a long ways in, in helping that, but we need some. Like Johnny said, a lot of answers, a lot of questions answered. And, uh, but I think this is a, an initial step in the right direction is joining forces with, with Nelson and Benson County, exploring those options, um, and probably including the Spirit Lake Nation on that, um, because there's access points and public access points within their boundaries as well. Uh, it, it's going to take a, a team effort to and keep ANS out of out of our area, out of our region. Uh, you know, we worked really hard several years back on uh, keeping curb out on our, our curb barriers, um, and uh, I, I think this is no exception. I think zebra mussels are. I think you do that research on them, and they're a, a scary, nasty little critter that uh, once they get in, you not get rid of them. They're, they're here forever and they populate like crazy. Uh, Here's a discussion of motion. Seeing none, all in favor, vote by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we jump around so it's clear where I'm at here. Okay, we're up to Kevin. Right. Can I ask one question? Uh, Crystal, do you have copies of the changes that the, for the COVID-19? Can you make some copies of it just so we have it for everybody? Because I don't know if we're going to see it. Thank you. I just wanted to ask you before we got to that portion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Kevin, okay. okay. yeah, you're up. All right. I don't know if everyone got a copy of my second agenda. All right. Great. Uh, first of all, the project updates uh, posted. We have the gravel done on the supply line. So that's done now. Uh, that pretty much finished up all of our Parker projects for the summer. I see. Any questions on that? Okay, then we got the bill for the gravel on Ramsey 9B. That's over the and that invoice was for $43,605. And that's my motion to pay that. Motion to approve. Uh, second. Okay, we have a motion to second to pay the bill of Silver's further discussion. Seeing none, roll call. Olson? Aye. Fred? Aye. Brown? Aye. Sorry. 
have a motion and a second to uh, have so produce this block on 9A. Further discussion? All in favor, vote by saying aye. Aye. Both same side. Motion carries. And then also, I need to look for a room color to stock. It'll be just over 30, or right around 30,000. And this, all of these colors should last into next spring. So we'll have to order again for a while. Move to approve. Okay, we have a motion for a second to invite culverts to stock. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor by saying, oh, excuse me. Are we paying for them or are we ordering them? Order the order. Okay. All in favor, vote by saying aye. 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 Both same side. Motion carries. Sorry about that. I think we're paying for them. Okay. The same thing with cutting edges. I just need to order them for now. I can store the motor graders for the rest of the summer and also for doing winter maintenance. So they're going to cost twelve thousand and ninety dollars. Move to approve. Second. Okay. Motion is seconded by cutting edges for the graders. Further discussion. Seeing none, all in favor, vote by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same side. Motion carried. And North Dakota Telephone Company is asking for permission to carry a fiber optic <coughs> cable on Transit County 1 on the north side of the bike path. We've got to admit it better. Is that all right? Yes. Sir. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not the way to talk. Yeah, I guess I look at it, I don't, I don't see a problem with it. It's about 750 feet. It'll stay within our right away. And it'll be uh, kind of trenched in for the vibratory trench. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Yeah, we have a motion in a second to uh, allow NUTC to raise the fiber cable in the right away on County 1. For the discussion. <coughs> we don't bore them anymore, Kevin? Uh, they do, they have to, they'll go under one approach, they'll bore that, but if they're not disturbed in that approach or a road or something like that, then they try and find other ways to do it. Well, it says they're going to bore underneath the yeah. Thompson's driveway here, right. so yeah. they'll bore in the driveway and they'll cut the rest. That's not going to bore the whole thing.
Okay, so we have a motion and a second to uh, sign on the low pass. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor vote by saying aye. Aye. Motion to sign. Okay, the last thing I have is just to uh, let you guys know that I'm going to be taking votes on the guardrail for that far south bridge. I think we're ready to get it installed now, so we have to add some more dirt to the site to make the Wi Fi for the post. So we're ready to take votes now with this. So at the next meeting, I'll probably have those results. It's not going to be high enough, but we have to advertise in the paper, so I'll just call two or three vendors and take votes on it. I guess we'll approve that. We have to get yeah, so get the photos. Okay. Before we go. Okay. Anyone else? I have one question to ask. Um, I've had several calls, and we've talked about it before on the Ramsey County floor where they made the cut, and then they replaced, re 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 repaired it. My question is, do they? Okay, so. There's a concern in terms of a change in estimate for the water board, but previously there weren't those additional culverts in there. So, are, are we going to allow them to keep the culverts in after they after they made the cut and put a culvert in, or are we going to ask them to take the culvert back? So, do you guys? We kind of turned that over to the water board, and I think they took. I don't. I didn't get to that meeting, but I think they took the stance that unless there's a complaint, we're complaining. They're not going to take action. Really? So, the water board, right? Well, I think it was, um, and we had sat through a, one of our summer conferences for the water meetings, uh, had an attorney where it's not the water board's authority, but it's the, the highway departments. It's the road departments and responsibility. So it falls back upon us as a county. Well, I've just I've had the question. You know, obviously that's up in my neck of the woods. So I've had, had a few neighbors call, and they said, you know, if if we don't essentially do something and tell them you can't just decide you're going to put additional culverts in some place, then what's going to stop the next guy from going on? Right? And, and and I I understand the rationale behind that argument because essentially at this point in time, if if the water board won't do anything about it, we won't do anything about it. Then essentially somebody just got to do additional drainage without right having to ask anyone. Well, I assume we were still, it was, it was still an issue, you know, that the water board hasn't returned any oh, board of action to this or what we're supposed to consider. So I was waiting for the water board. I, I didn't think it was a dead issue at all. I didn't think it was necessarily a dead issue, okay. but I just wanted to bring it up to see where we were at for it because I've had the question multiple times. I don't know, did you get in on that water board? Uh, bits and pieces of it. Um, Who is the chairman again? Brian Volk. Um, I gave Brian all the background. Um, but, but I'm pretty sure that during our, our uh, and that webinar that we had partaked in in the uh, summer conferences, that it fell back upon the county highway. So that's why the feet are just pulled down. You know, so if we, and, and this is what I think should happen, is that we should ask the landowner to remove those culverts, or we will do it for them at, and build them back for them. Um, well, I want to make sure we have jurisdiction to do whatever we're going to do, but I, I just wanted I just wanted to know where we were at on it, more of a question than anything, to see, yeah. you know. Jeff, I would answer that question. I wouldn't let the landlord back in there. We didn't want him in there first. Well, and we don't want him back in there again. Okay. Yeah, you know, you know, so right. they were in the wrong stepping in there in the first place. Right. But we don't want that to happen again. Um, if we're going to do something, we're going to have Kevin in charge and put it back to what we want. Well, do we have any, I mean, apart from billing them for the cost, I mean, should, is that fine enough? You know, or should we, is there some ability to levy a fine? Because you really don't want private citizens to feel empowered to go and do whatever they want with county property, wherever they want to. At least without permission. Yeah, 
Well, and that's the thing. I mean, it, it's 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 tough to put your head around with that, but I mean, if it's if it's in the county right away, it's it's no different than the county courthouse or the county shop. I mean, it's the county property. I mean, and, and they went on and just decided they were going to do something, and and it's like I said, I want to make sure that we're doing it the right way. But I just wanted to know where we were at if we heard back. You know, because I have, like I said, I've gotten multiple calls saying, well, what are you going to do about this, <laughs> essentially? And, and uh, I didn't have a good answer yet because I hadn't really heard it. Are you talking with Gary? She said it would be something that along the lines of destruction of public property or um, along those lines, and it would have to be turned over to the insurance department for an investigation um, and based upon what their findings from that investigation would come up charges appropriate to it. And then there's, you know, different levels of, of uh, you know, criminal activity or, you know, fines and, and or criminal, you know, $10,000 fine, class B, misdemeanor, whatever um, type of situation they determine. But, um, and then I would would certainly encourage the private residents who were affected by that to bring up a, a civil lawsuit to reclaim the damages from the, the flooded crops that were caused by that action. I guess on some level, you know, even if the Franklin Road Commission was going to be no different than some private citizen coming and cutting a, a hole in the wall of the uh, uh, county commission them upstairs so that they had easier parking access. Right. And it's not really any, any well, different. And it's, it's county right away, it's county property, and we retain that for a reason. I mean, that it's not it's supposed to be left the way it is for a reason. Right. I just want to, so, I mean, I, we don't have to pick any action. I just wanted to bring it up so we can get some clarity on how we're supposed to move forward so we can address it probably in our next meeting or meeting on wherever it's going to be. But just so it, it's not forgotten, we have some options on, on what we're going to do, or at least we get some clarity on it. So. Okay. We're going to do something. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. We, we're going to do something. We got to let Kevin get on it. Before well, yeah. The calendar we're already, runs off. Yeah, we're already the first meeting of September. So, <laughs> okay, if we're going to do anything about it, like take them, you know, uh, make a move to take them back out, whatever that's going to be, then we have to give you some time to actually just, just try to add to it. One thing, Kevin, what do you think? Uh, looked at it, you could come up with some type of plan to put it back to what it was. Oh, yeah, it would cost a whole lot of cost. We just There's one on an actual township road that, you know, we got to be careful how we place out. The other three are on two coaches. The township road one, the township had to stay on that one, right? Mm -hmm. Or is it up on the right of way? It is on the right way. Work with I hope we can just come to some kind of agreement and put it back to the work. I think we have the equipment we can do it ourselves. That would reduce the cost. Maybe that's something we should do now. I mean, like Cap said, here we are in September. We had a snowstorm in October. Kevin's not handled it. It's pretty busy. Yeah, yeah that snowstorm didn't fly off. Yeah. Wow. Well, Don't I talk mean, about I, that. I, I would make a motion to have Kevin. Put it back the way it was. You know, Let's have a look at it. Yeah. Well, I mean, but if, if we need to go to a, a penalty like sheriff's pronouncement, we probably don't want to change the evidence. Well, I think everybody knows the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, would it make sense to start by approaching the landowner and getting them to agree to pay the cost of, of taking out the culverts and, and bringing them back? Um, and I don't know if we find them on top of that or not. If they won't agree, then at that point you pursue potentially the sheriff's department that, that Would that be fair to Should we offer them the chance to do it themselves? I mean, just a thought. Just a but like we talked earlier, we don't want to back in the ditch. Right. Unless we oversee the report. Well, I, 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 I think it's a deal where it's, it's, it's all right away. They shouldn't have been in in the first place. We should do it. We should close it back up and they should be Cost of what it's going to cost us to repair the area and put it back to the way it was before. Kevin, you believe you can fit it in your work schedule? This month, October, I'll be able to. This month. This month. October. Yeah. 
total against our all chips when we're busy for three weeks. Well, let's. Uh, let's <laughs> go back to where it was. Okay. I could wait until the next meeting. It's still good. good. I could. I, I just want to make sure we have clarity to make sure we're making, we're, we have the authority to make the decision. I'm assuming we do it's all right. But, you know, I don't want to step on it. It's a lot more important you know, until we have clarity from now. Okay. To try to we'll probably get that clarity before the next meeting. Yeah. I mean, if we get some clarity, we still have time at the next meeting to make a decision and allow you guys to get the work done. That's okay with everybody. Sorry, can we not have 30 more work? Did they not? Well, I, I, I guess. Do, they punched it back to the highway curve? Well, that's. We don't really have that. Okay. I just want to make sure. That's the assumption. I guess we haven't had anything written from them or documentation. I guess. Has anybody seen any specific documentation stating what they're doing or what they are doing? I haven't. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. Okay. I think there's been a lack of communication and need to know who's going to be conveying that information to who, kind of thing. Um, you know, I think last time around it wasn't properly conveyed, and I don't know if they really knew about it, or I don't know if it was, because I don't know if it was on their agenda for their last meeting, and um, probably should have been well, before their discussion. I apologize if I sprung this on this meeting, but I just saw culverts up there and then it made me think of it that I got called on it, so I just picked it up. Do yeah. we want to make a directive to the water board to get this? When, when did they meet again? They meet uh, Monday the 14th, I think. So the day before we meet. Right. I would say, yeah, let's let's make sure that they have the discussion if they have it to give us some clarity on what their position is, and then we could have Gary also look into is it theirs or is it our decision to make. That second meeting in September, then we'll have to drop that on what we're going to do on that. Do you want to do a motion or not? It doesn't matter. I mean, it's. it's I didn't run that motion. No, I didn't. No, but I, I mean, you were thinking that. In fact, you were thinking about it. Mark was thinking. Yeah, I was. Well, Mark <laughs> well I'll, I'll, I'll make, I'll change it. I'll make my, my motion to direct the water board to come up with a decision at their next meeting so that we can discuss what we're going to do at our next meeting. I like that. Second. We have a second. Further discussion. <clears throat> and concurrently, I'll bring it up with Carrie just so she can make sure that we get some Okay, all I'm going to vote by saying aye. Aye. All right. Close the same side. Motion carries. All right, very good. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay, up to COVID-19 discussion. So essentially, uh, yeah, the use of masks for COVID visitors, customers where we made that change. Uh, so there was essentially two different questions. The question of, we've had a directive in the past that uh, when you are outside of your workspace as an employee, uh, you should be wearing a mask. 
Uh, the question then was asked, uh, how about meeting usage? So if everybody comes together for a meeting, so does that technically count as their workspace, or does that technically count as out of their workspace? Uh, and that question was brought up at the last department head meeting. Uh, Crystal directed it to public health, and I asked public health to be here today, but I never got a response. So, um, but she asked public health for clarity on it, and Al said that uh, we should be requiring, uh, under the directive from the uh, Department of Health, that whenever they're outside their workspace in any capacity, they should be wearing a mask all night. So even if they go to a, a meeting or something like that, and there's multiple people in the room, then they should be wearing a mask at all times. Uh, and that's the Department of Health's uh, opinion. Now, it doesn't mean we have to necessarily adopt it, but that is what their opinion was. So that change has been made to the operating plan. Um, and then the other one was the question of, and this came up in the survey, uh, uh, accommodating employees with children when it comes to uh, now that we have school starting back up. Um, I'm probably the only one that has a kid in school anymore. <laughs> so I'm probably the most, uh, I've looked at probably to this the closest, the closest of all of you, but so there's, and I could probably have Crystal explain it, but there's the family's first something, I can't remember, FFRCA. And then there's FMLA, and then there's different guidelines under the FFRCA for how things are handled when it comes to leave. And we're required to give our staff certain leave when it comes to education of children um, in concurrence with allowing them the ability to do things like telecommute and things like that. So we, we just essentially the, the, the overarching message is we're going to have to be flexible with our employees because the law through the end of the year is we have to be flexible for them when it comes to uh, teaching kids from home. Uh, and, and the reason we have to be flexible is, and I, I double checked the plan for and I don't know the public school plan, I haven't read theirs completely, but I've read St. Joe's, and the minute we have one positive in the school, whether it's a student or a staff, we are closed off for 72 hours. The second one that happens after that first one, so if there's one positive and we have a positive within the next two weeks following that of one of our students or staff, we are closed for two weeks. And we go to distance learning automatically. So the concern with any of that is I would assume the public school has something similar in place. At the drop of a hat, we could have employees that all of a sudden are saying, my kid's going to be learning at home, what more am I going to do? <laughs> you know, and we have single parent households, we have two parent households, so we have to be essentially flexible. So that's essentially what this change is saying, um, is that we are, uh, you know, recognizing that the, the, the act is in place, we are going to follow the law as it states. There are ex excluded employees, which are emergency responders, like uh, the sheriff's deputies, child welfare workers, service providers, and the emergency manager. So they are excluded because they are considered essential workers. Uh, now that doesn't mean that we can't make accommodations from a department head if they have the ability to do so, but we don't, we aren't required to do so, where the accommodations have to be made for all of their employees. Quick, quick sidebar, which quick. is very important. Um, in your last sub-bullet point there, second sentence, uh, you might want to strike the word under at the end of the sentence because it doesn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Okay, so the last sub bullet point on the first page, second sentence, which ends with unless an employee elects to use existing county vacation or sick leave under a period. So, yeah, uh, the, the only question I would have, or not question, but uh, I'm kind of rambling here, I realize. But, uh, so then the other component of this is talking about children in the workplace, because if something happens at the drop of a hat, what are we going to allow our employees to do? Uh, Crystal reached out to our insurance. We got guidance that uh, we sh and, and from public health as well, stating that we obviously don't want more people in the building than we need in the building. But if it's a short term, you know, oh, school had to close at noon, I have nobody to watch my kid for a couple hours, 
they can come into the building as long as they stay in that parent's workplace, but they have to be older than nine years old because our insurance said anything younger than that and we have liability issues. So that's how the plan is written as is right now. Uh, the other thing that I would make note of is on that FFRCA, when we are required to give that parent leave to go uh, uh, home to teach a child, if we can't make the accommodation, then we still pay them, but they are at two-thirds rate of pay once they get past their initial two weeks if they want to use the COVID portion of it previous to the FMRCA. So the question is, do we want to, we, we can be more uh, uh, lenient than that, I guess is probably not the way. We can say we'll keep people at full pay or we can do the two thirds like the FMRCA. It's just we will only be reimbursed from CARES Act dollars to that two thirds rate. Because this is all reimbursable from the federal government because it's a, it's a mandate that they're requiring of us. Uh, through the, 31st of December this year. So, I'm sorry if I didn't have to be clear with that, but it's kind of convoluted because there's multiple tracks of what's going on here from federal government, from FMLA, from all kinds of different things going on. So, it's an addendum to the policy as stated uh, to cover so that our employees have some clarity about how it's going to be handled if that does happen. And all honesty, I don't know how many kids we have, uh, uh, how many of our employees have kids at school age. I'm sure there's a decent amount of them. We have a lot of employees. And uh, Rhonda's staff would be treated slightly differently, obviously, because of state guidelines versus, versus the county guidelines comparatively, but they would be similar. Uh, you have FFRCA guidelines and all that, too. So. We have about 25 kids under, most are under nine, unfortunately. So yeah. I, that was news. Yeah. So. And, and we had, and we discussed that back and forth. It's just the question of, you know, I understand the, the concern too, because at the drop of a hat, if you've got a kid, and what are you going to do with them type of thing? But that was the guidance from the insurance company is that we shouldn't know, you know, just because once you're younger than nine, I mean, I have a five year old, and she's kind of. I, I wouldn't want to work on that. Yeah, that was they, they did mention that first time I did mention that, you know, that 15, 20 minute window where kids need to yeah. get to school or come to school. That, that would be okay. Yeah. And, and we still have it written as long enough, if I'm reading it correctly, that it's still in the discretion of the department head if it's a 15 or 20 minute window or something where you're just trying to make a, okay, I had to pick the kid up, I'm making a plan, I'm trying to find a grandparent or whatever. You can sit with your kid at work to make that accommodation. But we just, like I said, I think the most important thing in, in hearing back from the department head meeting, from multiple different department heads and stuff, is we just we need to be flexible because who the heck knows what's going to It's kind of what it's going to I mean, from a flexibility standpoint, I don't know what we're going to do if something happens because the kids are going to be right in the town by the I make motion without the Okay. Any other motion? Do we have a second? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We have a second. Motion to second. Right? Do we have a second? Okay. Further discussion or questions? I mean, there's a lot of stuff here, so I want to make sure everybody has a chance to ask any questions that they, uh, that they have. And, and for open, honest, you know, for clarity, there was a split at the department head meeting on how we should handle kids in the workplace, if at all. Some thought that it shouldn't be something that should be allowed, some thought it would be okay. This is kind of a middle ground in saying, if it's a short-term thing, we'll deal with it, but it's not a long-term solution. And we're going to give you flexible working options and you can get home with your kid then and teach them at home if you have to. But if it's a bathroom or something, you have to accommodate, we'll accommodate it as best we can. Yeah, childcare, real problem. Yeah, real problem. One, you know, especially the situation now where you have some grandparents that are trying to distance and stuff like that, and well, that's usually the fallback. Well, grandparents. I just told Lucas that you had grandparents changing their phone numbers. <laughs> that's that's right. I don't. I'm not, I'm not lying. I don't know what, in all honesty, having kids, it's an eye opening experience because I don't know what we do with our grandparents and, and the community around that's willing to help the kids. I mean, it's just that uh, we always do, you know, you never know when something's going to come up. It's like straight out. I'm lucky I've got two sets of grandparents. 24, I think 20 minutes. Very lucky. 
It does. It does take a military staff. Well, I think half of our staff maybe forgot that. But as far as our, our, our department heads, it was eye opening and sad, actually. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's tough, too, if, you, if you're not used to having kids around stuff. And I understand the wanting to make sure that the workplace still functions, but there is. Flexibility is the name of the game right now. This is basically what we're talking about. So we have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Questions? You're okay with the two minutes for now? So this just goes through the first of the year then? The FFRCA does, yes. That will hold true until and then we'll see if they do an extension or how they're going to handle it after January 1st. Uh, at that point, we'll have to probably change policy depending upon where we're at. <laughs> It's kind of the nature of this whole thing. We're just we've had to make changes as we've gone along because guidance has changed and things have changed and we honestly don't know. Stuff. But yeah, this is this will be good through December and We'll see what the what Congress does or does not. I certainly think being a flexible and accommodating for parents is the real key. Yeah. Because nobody knows what's gonna happen. Well and the most important thing to me is I guess I look at it from this perspective where we have good employees, we have we got them here, we need to be flexible so we can keep them. <laughs> you know, as long as the work is being accomplished, let's be flexible and work with them because it, it costs a lot of money to train a new employee or have turnover because they had to quit their job because you weren't trying to help make it work well. Okay, uh, further discussion. None, all in favor, both by saying aye. Aye, aye. Both saying aye. Both carries. Very good, thank you. Okay. Uh, approval of the chair to sign the memorandum of agreement between Ramsey County and Dakota Prairie Community Action. I can have, I can have Rhonda kind of pull, I can tell you too. Um, this is an agreement with Prairie London. Um, this has been a long process of getting to know the world of Justin Messner and Russ Krasinski. So, um, this is FEMA funds. Um, we had to get uh, Mr. Uh, Perry Lane graciously agreed to be our fiscal agent and apply for the FEMA grant. Um, the FEMA funds will come to Ramsey County. He's done a lot of work for our county to get those grants for the non congregate housing for COVID positive people that need quarantine or are homeless. So we appreciate his work. Part of that work is we needed a memorandum so that when we get the funds, we can pay uh, Dakota Prairie back. It costs about $1,400 for 10 days or 14 days, depending, give or take some odd dollars, for um, our non-congregate housing. We have housed uh, since, the, the, to give you a little history, the program was started by the, the Department of Human Services person, Sarah. She has a background in um, homeless housing projects. And so she started it with the idea that it would be handed off to the counties. That didn't go so swimmingly well, but um, we did manage to come together and figure out a way to pay for it. Um, it 75% of it is FEMA dollars, 10% is reimbursed by the state of North Dakota, and 15% are CARES Act dollars through our health department. And so we have a memorandum with Ramsey, Towner, and Benson. Those are the three counties I'm involved with, Ramsey, Towner, Benson and Rolette because of my job as the um, Zolo director for our agency. I know the state person is working directly with Cavalier Emergency Manager and Cavalier County Emergency Manager and any county emergency manager to get this memorandum signed with their commission. So um, we have, unfortunately, um, there are any given time 15 to 20 people in our non congregate housing because if you live with someone and you're COVID positive or you, or you need to quarantine, you know, they say, sorry, you can stay here, you need to leave. So um, I think that so far since the state quit administering the program, so to speak, we've had about four people. So five. So as of July 19th or 20th, we've housed five people under this from Ramsey County. So um, we've been running, running it for what about, what did you say, July 15th? July 19th, 15th, so it's six weeks we've had five people. So it's being utilized. Tanya, um, Tanya not from our agency does the intake. There are very strict rules. A lot of times people don't make it. They just say, okay, no thanks. Because you can't leave your room. We have um, 
the the um, Larry Leonard from Rolette County, the senior meals um, coordinator, uh, has been very, very helpful. So our senior meals is very helpful also. They'll deliver the food. There's a fridge and a microwave in the units that we use and the motel that we use. So they deliver Saturday and Sunday on Friday. Um, so we've, we've um, Spirit Lake Nation has, I believe they have 15 rooms being used right now. So it's very busy. Um, with our numbers ticking up, I expect that, you know, we'll continue. We haven't had a high need, thank goodness, but so that's kind of where we're at. We hope to have a, um, an agreement tomorrow, I believe, or maybe Thursday, we have a meeting with Justin Messner and Russ Krasinski, I don't know if I'm saying his name right, um, with Turtle Mountain to see if we can do some work. Because, of course, from Rolla to drive to the shelter, the non congregate shelter in Devil's Lake, which is a motel is very difficult. If someone's COVID positive or had close exposure, no one really wants to give a ride. So um, we're going to work with um, tribal partners there to see if we can lawyer in on their contract for their rooms that they're using. So um, that's kind of where we're at. Thanks. Sorry. We're mostly in a second to send the documents with the MOA. Further discussion. All I'll say is a uh, thank you to Rhonda and, and everybody that's putting them all getting together because the state kind of just, I think they thought that we weren't going to need it anymore and all of a sudden it started to be needed again and we had to get something, we had to get something together real quick and it's functioning. So. Yeah, there was a communication break between public health and emergency managers too that was unfortunate. Um, and so we had to get together and figure out how to get it back on needed service. Like I said, four or five people isn't a lot, but if you're that one of those four or five people, it is a lot. It also creates a public health issue if you don't have somebody. Thank you. Thank Barry. I will. He's been very, very good to work with. Um, he he thought he could have fought on his own. He ended up using, of course, using our email number. If I could have, I got an email. I'll email you a copy. I have to send that to him as quick as I can. Um, so he ended up using our, it's our FEMA dollars, um, which I wasn't totally aware of how that worked either. So apparently at the beginning of the pandemic, our emergency manager applied for FEMA dollars, or is it just a given? I don't know what that process is, but we used our FEMA number. So I, Dakota Prairie will pay and we will reimburse because we're going to get the money. So yeah. thank, thank you. you. I appreciate it. Thank you for Okay. We're up to the business delegation. Okay. Portfolios. Commissioner Frith. Uh, not a whole lot. We heard a good presentation from uh, Sarah today on what's going on in the calling agent's office. Uh, state's attorney is uh, carrier remains busy with uh, different things. Their staff is still half time. Courts are being done by teleponic um, type of situations. Uh, they're going to reevaluate the uh, staff back in the office, uh, full staff anyway, uh, and reevaluate that uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, Airport Authority, $1.4 million in CARES Act. Uh, sounds like a for sure deal over the next four years. So, uh, O&M, uh, money that will be coming into the Devils Lake Airport. Uh, that initial report of $16 million. Um, we're still looking at what portion of that would or could come to Devils Lake Airport. Um, we'd certainly, certainly a lot of wishes and wants and, and needs out of the airport. Uh, Money uh, certainly can be spent, but uh, it's not going to be there when you're not going to spend it, kind of thing. Um, and chamber, uh, a lot of things have been put on hold uh, with some of their activities. Uh, Blind Walk was canceled. Uh, that was their big September event for the chamber, but uh, a lot of people feeling uncomfortable with having that many people walking walking downtown and uh, visiting their establishments. And then it's a very well-attended event. Um, we 
did have their chamber held long holding on Friday, which was uh, well attended and good uh, participation in that. So COVID's kind of thrown in one direction a little bit of everything. Okay. Mr. Olson. Everything's pretty quiet. We heard from Lake Access. LEC is running very well. High counts. Yesterday we were at 96. It's, it's, it's doing well. Other than that, the whole world is pretty quiet. Any better Commissioner Brown. Yeah, so was from Germany. She met last week. Heard about that. In jail. Maybe we had a party on her yesterday. 25 years ago. Who's today? Who's Chinese? Who's Chinese? It's already Italian. You can't believe it. It's already Italian. Congratulations, sir. Commissioner Wicky. Most proud of the Western Front. Thank you. It's quiet. And all I'll say is you guys heard from pretty much everything I've been to. I've got four of them to play tomorrow. Social services last week. We've heard plenty about that. And, uh, Party of September, it's hard to believe. Okay. okay. Anything else for the good of the order? Announcements? Seeing nothing, we're good.